Good evening, everyone, and a happy early St. Patrick's Day or a late National Pie Day, depending upon which way you want to perceive this. Uh, I am joined tonight by Kathy Hunt. So Kathy is the author of Herring, A Global History and Fish Market, as well as her latest cookbook, Luscious, Tender, and Juicy. She has written features and recipes for publications, including the Chicago Tribune, Reuters, and Taste of Home. Kathy's blog at kitchencat.com. Uh, Kathy blogs at kitchencat.com and divides her time between New York City and suburban Philadelphia, where she teaches farmhouse cooking classes. And tonight, we get to sort of experience one of those cooking classes. And I am incredibly excited because I love watching food get made almost as much as I love eating it, but not quite. So, Kathy, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share Luscious Tender Juicy with not only all of your customers, but anyone else who happens to tune in on your great YouTube channel. So thank you. Absolutely. So I know we talked about this a little bit before we went live, but tell me, what is it that we are going to be enjoying today? Well, tonight, um, in honor, as you've mentioned, both of St. Patrick's Day, which is coming up on the 17th on Thursday, as well as Pie Day yesterday, um, we are going to be making two dishes from Luscious Tender Juicy, which are very St. Patrick's Day friendly, and they will be um, scallops, buttery sea scallops, and then we will also be making a garlic pea puree, mm. which is my take on the UK and um, the Republic of Ireland's mushy peas. Mm. And then to cap off the night, I thought it would be fun for me to just make a very quick pie recipe, which is not from Ireland, but it does have those elements of green. Um, it's a key lime pie, and it'll be very quick. Um, and for anyone who's interested in learning about the ingredients and the history of key lime pie, that's going to be on my website, which is kitchencat, cat with a K, dot com. Excellent. That is super exciting. So I will, I'm going to let you, let you get started. Um, by the way, for okay. all the people in our live stream, if you have questions, if you go, ooh, I really like that, if you have comments, please put them in the live stream. I am... I'm big, using big air quotes here. I am moderating, which means in this case, I get to watch someone talented do their thing, and I will relay your questions and comments to Kathy so she can answer them here in real time. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I am cooking tonight from my 1801 farmhouse in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, which is about 20 miles west of Philadelphia, and about two miles um, I'm not sure west east of uh, the town book center, so uh, very delighted to be here. And as Drew mentioned, um, my husband and I also split our time in New York City, but uh, this is the hub of, and where all the action takes place in terms of cooking. And tonight, um, as I'd mentioned, we're going to be making, or I'm going to be making, and you're going to be enjoying uh, garlic pea puree, my take on mushy peas. And I have already started cooking the peas, so I have put five cups of frozen peas, as well as seven cloves of garlic on my stove top off to the right here, which you can't see. I, and I'm gonna let that cook for about 12 to 15 minutes, a little longer than one would normally cook um, peas, but it's going to give it a very nice soft texture. And when they're done, we're going to blitz them in the food processor, food processor with a few other ingredients. But while they're cooking, we're going to get started on the sea scallops and talk a little bit about St. Patrick's Day and Irish cuisine. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I am sure that many of you have heard of St. Patrick and the history of him. Well, it's more of a legend, but of him removing all the snakes from Ireland, which is why supposedly today there are no snakes in Ireland. Um, he was also credited with bringing Christianity to Ireland, Ireland during the 5th century. He was the Bishop of Ireland. He was also the, is the patron saint of Ireland. And in Ireland today, um, it is considered not only a public holiday, but also um, a religious holiday on St. Patrick's Day. And it is um, observed on March 17th because on March 17th, 461, St. Patrick died. So on this day today, still, um, folks will attend church but they will also go out and watch parades and um, attend fairs. Pub crawls are not as common as one might think. You know, in the U.S., everybody goes on a pub crawl or goes out drinking at the pub. But for the longest time, pubs were actually closed on St. Patrick's Day because it was a religious holiday. 
um, I love to travel. And so I have had the opportunity to spend some time in Ireland over St. Patrick's Day and observe St. Patrick's Day parades. Uh, and they are just so delightful in terms of sort of their grassroots and local enthusiasm. You will see tractors pulling floats that have been homemade. Um, you might also see more professional floats and balloons, uh, you'll see dancers, musicians. It's just a very festive and wholesome time. Um, and of course, today the pubs are open. So you can also just go sit in a pub with your family, your friends, and enjoy a few pints or many pints of stout as well as whiskey. Mm. And uh, you can also enjoy some seafood. And uh, tonight, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing buttery sea scallops. So I'm going to start first off by melting three tablespoons of butter. So in this dish, we're going to be using a brown butter sauce to coat the scallops when they're finished cooking. So to make the brown butter sauce, and I'm going to ask my AV man here to switch over my camera. To make the brown butter sauce, because I am making a half portion, I'm going to be melting um, three tablespoons of unsalted butter in the saucepan here. And uh, I'm going to be swirling it over the heat in a second as it starts to melt. And with brown butter sauce, the only ingredient is butter. And um, in French, it's called a beurre noisette. And forgive me, I took Latin, so my French is not perfect. But um, it, it means simply brown butter. And what happens is as you're cooking the butter over high temperatures, the water begins to evaporate. And then you slowly have the milk solids, which are the proteins and carbohydrates, that it starts to get, get toasted. And they have a chemical reaction with one another, which causes the brown butter to have this sort of hazelnut aroma and develop a very rich scent as well as a um, brown speck texture. So this is uh, slowly melting. So I'm just going to uh, stir it around a little bit longer over this. And as it's melting, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the scallops that I'll be using tonight. And mm -hmm. I'm going to be using sea scallops, which are the larger of two scallops that are available in the United States. Um, we have sea and bay scallops in the U.S. Sea scallops are more common. They're less expensive than bay scallops, which are much smaller. Um, sea scallops range in size from one and a half inches to nine inches. And bay scallops, I think they kind of max out at around one and a half inches. Now, if you were purchasing scallops in Ireland, um, First off, they would be caught off the coast of Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're getting very local seafood. And they would be called queen and king scallops. And they're very similar in size to our bay and sea scallops. Queen scallops, or queenies as they're called, are, are much smaller. Um, they tend to be a little tenderer than the king scallops. But king scallops, like our sea scallops, are um, much more prevalent and much less expensive and much bigger. So you to get more bang for your buck and it's a nicer presentation on the plate so uh, um, we do have a question from the live stream uh it's sort of a sure. two-parter here um is there any way to do this mm -hmm. in a vegan fashion i'm always careful with cooking to respect the recipe but also dairy and me are not friends followed up with more accurately dairy free i guess like i'm okay with seafood okay you're okay with seafood but not okay with doing a brown butter sauce you know um i have not cooked with vegan butters so you know i have used vegan butters as spread so i don't really know if they can become a brown butter you know like a brown butter sauce or not um mm -hmm. you could do this recipe and instead of using a brown butter sauce just use a sherry vinegar which you would cook down um, with a little bit of brown sugar and let it just cook over medium high heat until it thickens. It will be a different dish and it actually will be a dish that was in my first cookbook, Fish Market. Um, but you'll still get that same wonderful saucy scallop dish and very moist, very succulent, which is, you know, what the theme of my cookbook, Luscious, Tender, Juicy is, is making food moist and making it very succulent and either savory or sweet. Um, so right now, um, I'm going to ask my AV guy to switch back over to the overhead camera. And as you'll see, the butter is starting to bubble. And you'll see there are these little white specks. And those are the milk solids rising to the surface. And I'm just going to keep on swirling this over here 
until I start to see some brown specks forming, at which point I will take that off heat and then we will season the seed scallops. And uh, sometimes it takes a little longer than you would anticipate, but a good idea is to always throw your pan. Um, you can lift it off the heat if you don't want to hear that noise, but um, just keep swirling it because you don't want it to scorch. You don't want it to become just a very dark color. You, you want to sort of a toasted golden brown on this. All right, and while that is just kind of bubbling away, I am gonna step away from it for two seconds to grab my scallops. Um, and something I wanted to talk about when we're talking about selecting seafood and sea scallops, it's a good idea to talk to the fishmonger at your local market. Um, and if the person doesn't know whether the scallops are fresh, you know, Scallops are going to be frozen no matter what, and then they're going to be defrosted and put into the seafood case. And, and I'm just going to pause on that because it, I don't know if you can see, but we are starting to get those lovely brown specks mm. in here. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm going to just take this off the heat now because it's still going to be quite hot. And I'm going to set it right over on my other burner, which is not on at the moment. So anyway, getting back to the sea scallops, um, you, you want to talk to your fishmonger and find out you know, when do they defrost them? Because sea scallops are caught and then shucked on the fishing boat because their shells never completely close. And if you catch a scallop, if you get a scallop from the sea, it's going to unfortunately spoil very quickly unless you shuck it and take it out of the shell and then put it in a cold pack freezer. So these have already been frozen. I have already rinsed them and I am going to quickly season them with salt and pepper. Um, let's see if I can shift around here so you can see we have a little fish plate here to put our scallops on. Um, so just quickly salt and put salt and pepper on there to season. And um, I'm also going to preheat one tablespoon of olive oil. You can also use butter in here um, because I wanted to have a beautiful looking pan for everyone and not have it all messy with uh, burnt butter, <laughs> I decided to go with olive oil this evening, but the choice is really yours. So we have seasoned. Um, I'm going to make sure that the oil is melted. We don't want to get it beyond a medium temperature. If you see it sort of shimmering, it's too hot. We don't want our scallops to burn. They're a very delicate fish. And whatever you do, if you buy frozen scallops at your grocery store, if you, if you don't have um, a fishmonger whom you trust and you look at the fish in the seafood case and it seems to be just sort of sitting in a pool of water which is a problem for scallops because mm. you pay for scallops by the weight mm -hmm. um and right now scallops are quite expensive they're actually 32 dollars a pound where i purchase seafood so um i would suggest looking for dry packed scallops because dry pack scallops will not have any additional water in them. So you're, what you're paying for is the scallop itself and not anything that's been sitting in a solution. So if you look in the case and you see your scallop sitting in sort of this watery bath, maybe just go to the frozen aisle and pick up a bag of frozen scallops, put them in your freezer to defrost overnight, and then voila, you're going to have a really great scallop that you haven't had to overpay and pay for that additional moisture in them. So I think that we are good because my oil seems nice and smooth. So I'm going to drop one scallop in. There we go. Drop our next one. And here we are. And there we go. Now, generally, I would not say, oh, cover your scallops up. But tonight I'm going to do that just to keep the sound down a little bit as they bubble away. Um, and with scallops, you're looking at about three minutes on one side, flip it over, three minutes on the other. They should be done when they're opaque in color and they've started to brown on both sides. However, I highly recommend, just so you know that you've cooked your seafood thoroughly, which in Ireland, um, for the longest time, people did not want to eat seafood because there had been bad experiences with improperly cooked seafood or seafood that has been spoiled that was then served to folks so there had been a hesitation for many years mm -hmm. um and had folks had a thermometer uh and it's a very inexpensive tool that you can purchase at any 
hardware, grocery, cookware store, six or seven dollars. Um, I have a digital probe thermometer, and I use that to ensure that my seafood is cooked properly. Um, a sa um, food safety temperature for seafood is 137. However, keep in mind that seafood is cooked, um, continues to cook once you take it off heat. So if you probe your scallops, which I'll do in a minute, um, and you see that it's at 135, you can just feel free to take it off heat, plate it, or leave it in the frying pan um, and move on to the next thing, knowing that it's going to continue to cook for the next few minutes. Yeah. So, and... Uh, we've, got a, we've got a pair of questions here that just came in. Sure. Um, the first question is, do you recommend a specific brand of butter or are they all reasonably equivalent? I would say um, butters are reasonably equivalent. Um, certainly an Irish butter, since we're on an Irish theme tonight, mm -hmm. would be great. Um, a Kerrygold, I believe, a, it may still be uh, considered an Irish butter made in Ireland. Um, but what I would suggest is using unsalted versus a salted butter, because you can always add more salt, but if you use a salted butter, you, you can't take that salt away. So definitely use unsalted butter gotcha. when cooking and baking. Uh, and our, and our follow-up question, or our second question, I should say, is how do you determine if you have a good fishmonger? That, that, that's a great uh, question. That is a great question. Um, a simple way is to talk to him about where is the fish sourced from? Um, is it caught sustainably? How long ago um, did the fish come into the market? And if he can't tell you where the fish comes from, if it's sustainable or not, and you know what days they get fresh fish delivery, as well as the fact if you look in the seafood case, and as I said, the fish is just sitting either in the case of scallops in a bunch of water or in the case of other fish in sort of melting ice and it looks very kind of gray and it's not bright and shiny, that's a time where you say, you know what, I'm not going to shop with this market, I'm going to go somewhere else, or I'm going to buy a frozen version of the fish or shellfish. All right, so I'm going to take a peek, and uh, we're going to flip the sky. And that's a beautiful sort of deep brown color on all of these. So, um, I know that they're not quite done yet because we've only cooked them on one side, but I am going to check here just very quickly. Yeah, we're, we're, we're at about 101, 103 degrees. So a few more minutes and we should be good. So I am going to put my lid back on for a second. So again, you don't have to hear that sizzling. Um, and, and just talk to you a little bit about um, Irish national dishes. Now, we have scallops here this evening and we're doing mushy peas. But so often when people think of Irish food, they think of mutton stew or Irish stew, which is mutton stew. Um, they think of potatoes and they may think of um, such dishes as called cannon, which is um, a mixture of mashed potatoes as well as cabbage or kale and leeks. Um, there's also champ, which is mashed potatoes with onions or scallions or um, boxy, which we think of today in the US as a potato pancake. And that is, for me, that's one of my favorites is to have a nice potato pancake. And probably many of those who are listening tonight understand the rich history that Ireland has with the potato. Um, and of course the Irish potato famine was a tremendous problem in Ireland. Um, it hit in 1845 after a fungus, a potato fungus, which was in Belgium, moved over into Ireland and wiped out almost all of the potato crops. And unfortunately, um, the Irish people had been really fixated on potatoes. Over a third of the population received almost all of their sustenance from potatoes. It was um, supposedly reported that people ate between seven to 14 pounds of potatoes a day, which to me just seems like an extraordinary amount of potatoes to eat. So when they had this potato blight, they had no food sources, basically. And their famine taught the world the need to really diversify in terms of what crops your country produces. So um, it was an extremely unfortunate situation in Ireland, but it certainly became a global lesson for folks um, 
but of course tonight we're not going to do a potato dish so sorry about that um and, and i'll just mention um one other thing that uh Ireland is really known for, and it dates back to the seventh century, but they were really renowned for their porridges. Um, monks in the seventh century uh, recorded all of the different porridge dishes made from oats, barley, wheat, rye, as well as oat cakes and barley cakes. And um, I don't know if today oat cakes are quite as popular, but they still are part of Irish cuisine. Okay, so we're going to check real quick on these guys which should be done by now. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I'm going to take these off the heat right now. Now in uh, Luscious Tender Juicy, I do suggest that you cook with butter. You do not have, uh, when you make these, you do not have to actually cook them with butter. You can um, use olive oil as I've done this evening. And, or you can do a combination of olive oil and butter, but no matter what, you should at the very end dress your scallops with some brown butter sauce. So we're gonna plate that. And then I'm going to just set this aside for right now. Let's flip that guy over. And uh, at the end, I will pour the brown butter sauce over top. So here we go. Uh, and the next dish I'm going to make that will complement this is going to be our mushy peas. Now, traditionally, mushy peas were made with something called marrow fat peas. And marrow fat peas are regular peas that have been left out in the field to mature completely and then dry naturally on the vine. And once they're collected, um, Anyone who is interested in making mushy peas would just put those peas, those dried out peas in some warm water overnight, let them sit, and then the next day, um, cook them with some little bit of sugar and salt in the water and cook them until they're very soft, almost a porridge-like texture. Then the peas would be flavored with butter, salt, and pepper, and then they would be served with, of course, that ubiquitous fish and chips. Now, this evening, my mushy peas are actually just regular frozen peas, as I'd mentioned previously, and they're cooked alongside seven cloves of butter until very soft. And then what I'm going to do next is blitz them in my food processor, along with three tablespoons of, once again, unsalted butter. So I'll just put that in there. And then I'm going to be adding a quarter cup of sour cream. And then at the very end, I have some ground white pepper and some salt to add to the dish. So I am just gonna step right over here, grab my peas off the uh, burner and strain them. And then we're gonna pop them in there. But in the interim, if anyone has a question or a comment or Drew, you wanna chime in, please feel free. I am listening. I'm just going to grab my yeah, piece. I will, I will absolutely chime in. So I will say that uh, a big shout out to Sherry Vinegar. I use it when I'm cooking all the time. It is a weird ingredient to find sometimes, but it is a delightful flavor. I highly recommend it. If you're using anything that you feel needs a little bit of kick, like a vinegary kick, but you want some sweetness, Sherry Vinegar is a spectacular way to go. It never occurred to me to use it as sort of a replacement for butter, but having tasted it, mm -hmm. I can absolutely see it. That is, that is spot on. And that's a great suggestion because um, the original mushy peas, um, some folks will sort of flavor them with vinegar and sherry vinegar is such a, you're right, it is such a great flavor. I, I think that um, that certainly could be something that you could add to your mushy peas. And I think it would uh, complement the garlic in here as well as the sour cream. So great, great tip on that. All right, I'm just gonna spoon everything right into my food processor. Now, if you don't have a food processor at home, you can also use a blender, or if you've really got some muscles, um, you could kind of mash it up with mortar and pestle or just a really heavy um, spoon like this one. All right. So when you're doing this, I suggest just pulsing it a few times to get the right texture. We want it to be a little lumpy. We don't want it to be completely smooth. So maybe the puree might be a little bit of a misnomer, but nonetheless, um, that is uh, that is what I call it. So here we go. Set this over here. I'm gonna pop 
pop our lid on and then I'm going to pause and I apologize for the noise, but here we go. All right. So we've pulsed and uh, see if I can get, here we go. You can see it's a little chunky. And at this point, I'm going to add, and because it's St. Patrick's Day, we have our green spatula. We're going to add some sour cream to that lovely green mushy peas. Um, in Ireland, often you can buy mushy peas already pre-made in a can. And they are going to be sort of an electric green because they have put food coloring in there. If you choose to use canned peas, which I personally uh, have a, I think it's a childhood trauma from, from canned vegetables. So I really steer clear of canned vegetables. But if you make this with canned peas, just know it's going to be very gray in color. You're not going to get that rich green color. And, you know, you might want to use food coloring, although I, I certainly don't advocate it. Um, so I'm going to add my salt and pepper now and do a little quick blitz again. All right. And voila, we are done. We have our mushy peas finished here and ready to put in a bowl. And as I mentioned, I do five cups of frozen peas, or if you have fresh peas, if you're a gardener and you're making these uh, during the summer time, you certainly can use your fresh peas. Um, and that will serve anywhere from four to eight people. It really depends on how much you enjoy peas and uh, in my household, uh, my husband, who loves peas, could eat this entire bowl by himself. And he may do that this evening. I don't know. Um, but anyway, here we go. So here are our mushy peas. I was going to say, I, I am very jealous that he gets to bask in the food glory you guys are, <laughs> are creating over there. I'm I'm watching this all happen, and I'm, I'm oh, eyeballing. Oh, he's reaching. <laughs> I see it, yeah. I'm, I'm eyeballing what will be the frozen meal I'm having for dinner later this evening with, with a little bit of jealousy. <laughs> Well, I apologize. Well, I, if you're not too far, you know, I am two miles from the bookstore. So get slip on it. You know, I, I would I would take you up on that. I moved a little bit. I'm south. I'm in Bryn Mawr now. But otherwise, oh, Kathy, okay, I would okay. come over. I, I mean, we can leave. We'll schedule it. It's fine. Oh, great. Well, well, next time, next time. So here we have our mushy peas. Um, and I'm going just going to quickly show you... Uh, a little plating, and unfortunately, it's looking a little rough right there. So let's just try to fix that up a little bit. I think that we'll uh, just hide that excess of uh, moisture there with some peas. Um, and I will say that uh, I failed plating. <laughs> I'm joking. I didn't fail the plating class, but nonetheless. So here we go. Here are the scallops. We're going to add a little brown butter. Uh, and this is why, you know, people say, wouldn't you ever want to open a restaurant? No, I, I am not an artistic person when it comes to food plating. <laughs> but I think the stress would be just so intense. But nonetheless, um, forgive the kind of sketchy plating. So we have a lot of peas and we have our scallops here. So there we go. This is the first main course, I should say. And now Looks I'm going incredible. to just... Well, thank you. Thank you. It, it, it tastes a thousand times better than my presentation there. But anyway, um, sure. You know, I think you could use fava beans. Um, I also think that you could use um, soybeans. So, uh, I mean, either you'll have a different, a slightly different taste, but certainly you could try something else. And if you do, um, I, I strongly encourage you to reach out to me and let me know what you think of it and how it turned out for you because um, I, that is not something I had considered, but that's certainly a possibility. So yes, I think that the flavors would still be very complimentary. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to move on to dessert, which for me, I have a tremendous sweet tooth. So that's my favorite part of the any meal. Um, and as I mentioned, the dessert is key lime pie. And uh, for this, I'm just going to step you through it. I have already prepared the pie crust um, and it's really simple to make your own graham cracker crust. And of course you can buy it at the grocery store pre-made, but for this, I used um, one and one third cups of graham crackers, uh, crushed graham crackers. And 
That equates to if you are buying a box of graham crackers at the grocery store, you're going to use 12 sheets. And these are considered whoops, sheets of graham crackers. Um, you want to have all four. And you just put these in the bowl of your food processor or your blender. However, if you don't have a food processor or blender, don't despair. You can still make this at home. And all you need is a Ziploc bag and either a rolling pin or, in my case, an inherited meat tenderizer. Put your 12 sheets of graham crackers inside the bag and just take out all of your aggressions on that bag and on those graham crackers until you have a lot of lovely little graham cracker crumbs, which you'll then put in a large bowl, add one third cup of sugar, and then you're going to melt seven tablespoons of butter and toss those ingredients together. Put it in a nine inch pie pan like this or you know any type of pie pan that you may have and uh, press out the sides so that it's all even. And voila, you have a very simple homemade graham cracker pie crust with which you're going to fill it with key lime pie filling. Um, and I, I don't know how many folks are familiar with key limes themselves. Um, they come from Florida. They're a little larger than what we see in the grocery store, which are the Persian limes, which are right here. Um, they're actually more acidic. But when you buy key lime juice, which um, because we live on the East Coast, we don't have access to fresh key limes. So um, this is what I always see in markets, whether I'm in New York, Pennsylvania, um, visiting friends in Maryland or Delaware. It is uh, Nellie and Joe's famous Key West lime juice. And what you will need is you will need a half cup of key lime juice. You will need to also take a 14 ounce can of sweetened condensed milk, eight ounces of cream cheese, and a teaspoon of vanilla. Put those all in a large mixing bowl. Um, if you're extremely strong, get a whisk and just whisk until you have a very smooth um, batter or pudding or whatever one would like to put filling for your pie. And then um, you'll just pour it into this pie crust. And obviously, if you have an electric or stand mixer, your hand or stand mixer, that's going to be the way to go. And I'm kind of lazy. I don't have that much upper body strength. So I'm always going to that electric mixer to whisk this up together. Um, but then, so I had prepared my condensed milk, my uh, cream cheese, the key lime juice, and the vanilla extract, mixed it all up in advance, which you can do. Just refrigerate it once it's all put together. And then we're going to try to put this oh, okay i have all these different sp <laughs> green spatulas tonight we're just going to pour this right into our pie crust let it ooze out everywhere and what you're going to do then is either refrigerate or if you want a really firm thrilling i suggest freezing for at least an hour before serving we have a lot of filling here left. And to make it more festive, and if you've ever seen key lime pie that has been green in shade, it is because they have added food coloring. So you can certainly add a little dash of food coloring if you're looking for a super bright green St. Patrick's Day friendly dish. And uh, then once you've put that in there, you're going to top this with the grated zest of one to two limes. Now, I suspect anyone who has ever attended a cooking class with me knows that I love my microplane zester. And it is a tool that actually started out in woodworking. And they discovered, uh, and I don't know who the gentleman was who discovered that this woodworking planer actually worked extremely well for zesting cheese as well as citrus fruits and chocolate. So I'm going to get my little zester out and I'm going to start zesting the lime, which I had washed prior to our joining on YouTube here. You always want to wash your, wash your fruit before zesting. 
And let's see here. So we're going to have a very bright let's do take on here. Okay. So I'm going to get my other line and just do that again. And as I've mentioned, this is not in the cookbook, Flesh is Tender Juicy, but it is on my website. And uh, you can feel free to just Google, I believe it's the Apple Jane Key Lime Pie Conflict, or just Google, key, or just search on Key Lime Pie, and you will find this recipe out there. Obviously, it does not take very much time. It's pretty festive. It is amazingly delicious. And I think it's a crowd pleaser as well as... Uh, these are for two people, which uh, I think uh, tonight I'm going to be digging into that after we finish our conversation here. I think that sounds like a great idea. I am curious. Do you know, and I don't, any of the mm -hmm. history of key lime pie? Because when I think key lime pie, I think classic Americana. I think very 1950s, very, that that's the image that conjures. And I don't know, is that accurate? Is there different, you know? That's a great question, Drew. I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, um, it is originally thought to have uh, originated in the in Key West and the first written recipe in Key West is from 1939 um, and that was sort of to highlight their key or their key limes however um, historians have looked into this a little further and discovered that sweetened condensed milk which was uh, a product of Borden milk company uh, they actually tested a recipe in their test kitchen in New York City in 1931 and that was for key lime pie and the creation of that was because they wanted to sell more sweetened condensed milk however if you talk to anyone from florida and specifically key west they will be outraged if you say <laughs> oh you guys didn't create it no 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 this is a new york city thing because of course it features their of course. You know, quintessential fruit key lime so yeah. and uh, apparently this was actually based on a lemon pie that Borden Company had also put out that featured sweetened condensed milk. But it is very much Americana. It is not an Irish dish, uh, unless perhaps, I don't know, maybe perhaps the rest of the tester in New York was Irish. I don't know. So <laughs> don't quote me on that. But nonetheless, because it is such a you know lovely green oh, it is. shade to the top, and of course, you can add a little food coloring if you just want to go crazy for your St. Patrick's Day celebration and jazz up your pie. So hence the use of key lime pie tonight. So once we're finished, I'm going to pop this in the freezer for 45 minutes to an hour just to make sure that it firms up and then slice and enjoy. Perfect. Very cool. I, I appreciate the, the history lesson and getting to learn kind of the, the etymology of this pie. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, and uh, there are many, many other dishes within um, my cookbook, Luscious, Tender, Juicy, mm -hmm. which are St. Patrick's Day friendly as well as everyday life friendly. Um, I have a goat cheese mashed potato recipe. So if you're like really wanting to pair the scallops with goat cheese mashed potatoes, you certainly can do that. I also have a parsnip mash. Um, all of my recipes are based upon travel actually i i am quite an inveterate traveler i've been to 51 countries and counting and whenever i travel i always pick up recipes from local cooks whether and chefs so i love to feature different cuisines in my books and it was uh, really fantastic that i had the opportunity to talk tonight about some uk inspired dishes um and the republic of ireland inspired dishes Excellent. for uh, saint patrick's day and the pie for pie day as well. Excellent. Well, I hope before uh, before we let you go, you'll indulge me and allow me to ask two quick questions that aren't necessarily related to the recipe. It's to the recipes themselves. Um, sure. So I'm always fascinated with the creation of cookbooks. I feel like mm -hmm. you know someone has an idea for a novel. They have a story. They work it out. They write it. They create it. And while it's an incredibly intense process, I think all of us, on some level, are storytellers, and we have an understanding of. Here's how I would tell a story, whether or not that translates mm -hmm. or how that translates into a book is a totally different thing. But a cookbook mm -hmm. is really unique because, A, it has to be informative. It also has to be appealing. It also has to feel approachable, but that the mm -hmm. end result is spectacular. You are obviously a veteran of cookbooks. So my first question is, 
what's something that you've learned along the way of writing these cookbooks that if you could go back to you in the past, writing your first one, you could sit down and go, oh my gosh, Kathy, you just you need to know this thing. What would that be? Um, I, I think not so much the writing of it, but certainly once the book is published, how much more work is involved. Mm. As, as you, as a, a bookstore owner, know how... Um, you know how much authors are hustling to do events to not only be the writers and in my case I am not only the creator of recipes they tester of recipes um, having recipe testers as well as taste testers try my recipes um, and in the book that I just had come out I photographed almost all of the recipes within the book so I oh, served wow. as a photographer as well um, and uh, I'm a writer. I, I, am, I have a master's in journalism. I have written about food for 16 years almost. So uh, it, it feels like when you are the writer of a cookbook, you are wearing so many hats. Um, and in my case, I, I've really been delighted that I've been able to use so many of my different interests and get so many friends involved with uh, helping me get these books out there. And uh, Supporting me not only in these events, but also supporting me through recipe testing and being taste testers. So Excellent. I think that's something that every cookbook or new cookbook author keeps to, has to keep in mind that they will be doing a lot more than just testing the recipe. <laughs> they will be wearing it just a lot of different hats. Oh, spectacular. By the way, if you find yourself in need of a person to taste things at some point later on down the road, you let me I, know. I'm I would be delighted. <laughs> I would be delighted to share. I did feel, especially, um, I wrote this book during the pandemic. I w had a very unique situation where I was able to get a new agent, um, have my agent sell my book to a publisher, and then for me to write, and then have uh, not only me but also uh, recipe testers test all my recipes within the book during the time of the pandemic when people weren't you know, some people weren't even going to the grocery store. And meanwhile, I was out there dropping things on people's doorsteps or sending recipes to very skilled recipe testers and saying, please try this. And I know you're going to have to hustle to get some ingredients. So No, that um, must have been yeah. so wonderful for them, though. Um, yeah, we, that was. We do have another question from the live stream, then I'll, I'll come back for my sort of penultimate question. Um, sure. The question is, have you ever considered lime meringue pie? Oh, no, and I am really intrigued by that. So I, I'm assuming um, it would be like a lemon meringue pie, but with lime instead, and that sounds delicious. So I might be trying that <laughs> Friday. I think that could be something I test out on Friday, and that sounds just spectacular. As yeah, I think that would is, really translate as well. As someone who is baking illiterate, as I like to say about myself, what intrigues you about a lime meringue pie? Because you were very quickly interested. So what's 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 going on there? Oh, you know, I just always like to try something different. I think the lime, um, you know, we're so used to lemon meringue pie, but lime obviously is another great citrus that lends itself to making that type of dish. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm always interested in something new or a creative take on an old classic. So. That, that really, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to try to test that out. So thank you, whoever suggested that. That's really great. I love that. Uh, and then I guess for my, my final question, and it's one of my favorite questions to ask, you know, obviously the, the, the act of creation is somewhat collaborative. You know, you, you, work, mm -hmm. you work with a person or you work with yourself or you, you work with just the, the thing you've created and, and you learn from it and you expand mm -hmm. from it. With this book, with Luscious, Tender, Juicy, what have you... What did you learn along the way that you can kind of look back at and go, wow, that was really something I wasn't expecting? Um, well, I will say for it, for anyone who knows me well knows that this book was actually called Moist when I started out. Ah. And uh, just the sort of visceral and negative reactions that people have to that term, um, it was very quickly the title switched from Moist to Luscious, Tender, Juicy, even though this whole book uh, talks about moist cooking and how to bring moisture into food. So I think uh, perhaps just the English language and how some terms really evoke a, a very negative response in people, but yet... Um, you know, something that was equally titillating, in my opinion, which was luscious, tender, juicy, 
has been uh, far more of a draw to folks. So I, I would say that was something that I certainly learned about the English language and people's interpretations of a specific word. No, that's fascinating. It's, it's, yeah. it's fascinating to think that we're, as a society, we're more accepting of luscious, tender, juicy, but moist, we're like, oh no, 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 not, you can't use that word. That's yes, incredible. yes, and, and um, I had, uh, yeah, I, I have definitely had people be very uh, hesitant to even go into the world of moist cooking because it uses <laughs> that term moist. But, you know, you don't want you don't want a dry cake. You no, don't want you a, don't. a parchment like piece of fish. You you yeah. don't want your meatloaf to be like a brick. You want it to be moist. Word, you want it to say. have moisture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so that, that does lead me into the portion of the show where I have to be a, uh, a shameless shill. So if you liked this presentation tonight and you went, oh my gosh, I want luscious, tender, juicy, I love moist cooking. See, now I'm saying it. You, yeah. <laughs> and you want to support a, a humble, friendly, local bookstore. You can do that. Uh, so we carry copies of Luscious, Tender, Juicy at Town Book Center. And in addition, we have signed copies of Luscious, Tender, Juicy. Um, you can pick those up in the store. We are located in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. We are right across the street from the largest Wegmans in the country. We're also apparently five-ish minutes southeast-ish of Kathy. Not that we're saying where Kathy is. Don't, don't stalk Kathy. Um, <laughs> but we are in that general area. However, if you are not comfortable going out and shopping in person yet, or if you're just not in Pennsylvania, you can always shop with us online at townbc.com. That's C-O-W-N-E-B-C, B as in Bravo, C as in Charlie, dot com. Um, and Kathy, again, thank you so much for letting us into your home, letting us see you, you cook. Um, like I said before, or during the show, I now I'm going to go and heat up a, uh, lean cuisine pizza for one. And I'm going to be thinking about those scallops though, cause they looked incredible. It was so wonderful getting to work with you again today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone who attended, um, and who perhaps listened after the fact. It's really just so delightful to be working with an independent bookseller and to be sharing my passion for cooking and for luscious, tender, juicy, or moist food with you. So, <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Have a wonderful night and stay safe out there. Take care.